As you know, we are indeed in the middle of a series uh, entitled Resurrection Stories. It started last week with a message about belief. Remember, Jesus is the resurrection. He is the get up again. Can I get an amen this morning? He is the life. That word there means substance, life, real life, true life. He is the resurrection and the life. This week, we're going to talk about worship. Worship. It's familiar stories. All these are familiar stories. But I think the Lord has given me something fresh to say to our hearts uh, uh, about them. This, the message that I'm going to preach this week or the story this fa- week is found in all four Gospels. You know, um, there, are, uh, there are only a certain number of stories that show up in all four of the Gospel accounts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And this story shows up in Matthew 21, Mark 11, John 20, no, I'm sorry, John 12, and in Luke 19, which is where we are going to be this morning. Luke 19, beginning at verse 28. If you take your Bibles out, take your devices out, and let's turn there. After Jesus said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt there, which has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he was told. And as they were untying the colt, the, its owners asked, why are you untying the coat, colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. In fact, one of the other gospels uh, specifically says, and the owners released him. The owners sent him. They brought it to Jesus, threw their coats, cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, the people spread their cloaks on the road. Again, one of the other gospels specifically mentions the palm branches, which I'll mention here in a minute. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Hosanna, they praised. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones themselves will cry out. Father, I thank you and I praise you this morning for the privilege I have for a few moments to share your word, to stand in your desk. This is your pulpit. It's my honor and privilege to stand here. And I pray that I would represent you well and that we would hear what the Spirit's saying this morning. I pray that you remove any obstacle, whether it be distractions, whether it be uh, uh, someone's mind wandering somehow. And for this few moments, you would capture our minds, our attention, our imaginations, and let us hear what you are saying today. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. An elderly lady was making her way into a church, a rather large church. She was making her way in from the back, and one of the ushers went to give her a hand. She was having kind of a difficult time making it in, and, and one of the ushers came in and said, may I give you a hand? She said, certainly. He says, where do you want to sit? She said, I want to sit in the front pew. And the usher said, you don't do that. And he said, she said, why, why don't I want to do that? She said, well, just to be honest with you, our preacher's boring. And she looked at him and she said, do you know who I am? And he said, no, ma'am, I don't. She said, I'm the, I'm the preacher's mother. <laughs> and he said, do you know who I am? And she said, no, I don't. He said, good, I'm going to sit you down. I'm thankful for the people that sat on the front pew. Let me just say that right up front. Her reason for coming to worship went beyond, right, the aesthetics. she, She had a reason for being at worship. And here's what I know about worship. Your reason for worship determines your worship. Spiro, your reason for worship determines the height of your worship, the depth of your worship, the length of your worship, the expression of your reason for worship determines your worship, right? And every person under the sound of my voice has a reason to worship this morning. Amen. We got a reason to worship. Let me talk to you as I've done last week. I want to give you some general observations about this story because it's a familiar story. And then I want to dig into some, some specifics that can help apply to us. And so there's some general things about this story that just jump out to you that I think are important for us to know. One thing is this. 
Uh, and, and, and some of these observations about wor- worship. One thing is this, the insignificant thing is the important thing to Jesus. That, little, that donkey tied up somewhere down the road, that, had not, that had, all that donkey uh, had ever done was but stood and been fed and been stalled and, and the, the, it had never been ridden by anyone. And to, to many, that donkey looked insignificant. But I want to tell you this morning, to Jesus, that donkey was significant. He rode Jesus into his triumphal entry in that place. And I want you to know this morning, listen to me, morning. in the grand scheme of things, it may seem un important. But when it comes to worship, listen, the insignificant becomes significant when he's used for worship for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Worship him even in the insignificant. Amen? I think we miss that so many times. We miss worshiping him in the insignificant. A second thing is this. There are always those that are going to ask why. There are always those going to ask why. There are always going to be those going to be wonder why you live a Christian life. There are always going to be those why you give God praise for everything that is given you. There are always going to be those who are going to wonder. Um, in fact, some of them may look in your life and say, I'm not even sure you have a reason to praise, but you know you have a reason to worship. You know you have a reason to praise. There are always going to be those that ask why. I want to tell you, listen, worship even when they don't understand, right? Worship even when they do not understand. Another thing that jumps out to me about this story is that People are going to worship. People are going to worship. The crowd had to worship him. It just, it began to flow. It began to happen. The crowd had to worship him. They, they found a way, whatever it was, to worship. And here's, here's what I know about people. People are going to worship something and somebody. But we are designed to worship. And I, I, know, that, I know that a lot of people that, that today that want to deny God and to deny uh, uh, worship of him, and I, I get that, but pe- people are going to worship something. Every, every person, every individual was designed to worship. And if we don't worship God, we'll worship ourselves. If we don't worship ourselves, we'll worship money. If we don't worship money, we'll worship the material things. If we don't worship the material things, we'll worship the sexual things. Pe- people are going to worship. And here's what I want to say to you. Make sure you you worship the one that is worthy to be worshipped. Make sure your worship is aimed at the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We're all going to worship. It's just a matter of what or who we're going to worship. I want to make sure my worship is for the one that died on the cross of Calvary for me. Amen? People are going to worship. People are going to worship. The fourth thing that comes out in this story is this. Hmm. When Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life, comes, worship erupts. Worship erupts. Listen to me this morning. Worship is something from the soul. This kind of ties hand in hand with what I just said a moment ago. Worship is something from the soul. The soul is the mind, will, emotions, and conscience. And worship just erupts when, when you've come into personal contact with the resurrection and the life, the King of kings, the Lord, the Lamb of God. When you've come into, uh, into, into personal contact with him, worship from your soul just erupts. And can I tell you this morning that, that sometimes that, that worship, up, uh, that erupts there. Sometimes it's difficult, but give leeway, give way to that worship. When, when the resurrection and life comes, worship happens. There's another truth here that is a difficult truth for me to understand, but I, but I get it. There will always be those who oppose worship. Listen to me this morning. There are always those that oppose worship. The Pharisees, uh, the Pharisees, because they had their own agenda, You hear me this morning? The Pharisees, because they had their own agenda, they opposed the worship of Jesus. And can I tell you, we live in a world today that is full of people and institutions and places that have their own agenda, and that's why they oppose the worship of Jesus Christ. And never in American history have we seen the public opposition of worship like we do today. It's because people have their own agenda Therefore, they don't want us to worship Jesus. Political agenda, social agenda, gender agenda, sexual agenda, monetary agenda. There are a lot of competing agendas. And those, listen, those that oppose the worship of Jesus, you can always count on it. It's because they have their own agenda. But do not let that get you off of your agenda, which is to give praise and glory and honor to Jesus through worship, right? Because here's what I know. This is the fourth thing about this. God is going to be worshipped. 
Jesus said, even if the rocks themselves have to cry out, uh, worship is going to happen. If these are quiet, the rock, creation itself, he says, uh, would erupt in worship. Listen to me this morning. Don't let a rock worship for you. You worship for yourself. He's done something for you. Worship him. Amen? Worship him. Here's the key point to this morning. Here's the key point to this morning. When you have personally encountered the resurrection and the life who is Jesus Christ you have to worship something inside of you has to worship Luke records that because they saw the miracles they worship John records that this was the crowd that saw him raise Lazarus from the dead and they worship the point is this when the resurrection and the life comes worship happens and I want to be a part of that worship I want to be counted among the ones who are waving the palm branches and spreading the coats and shouting Hosanna King of Kings and Lord of Lords and worshiping him now I think most everybody that is here this morning, I know you personally, everybody that's here this morning, I know you personally and probably most everybody that's viewing online right now. And I know that most all of us agree about this idea of worshiping and him being worthy and our why determines our worship. What we sometimes do not fully understand is the height and the depth and the breadth of our worship. So from this story, I want to show you some, some lessons, lessons that you and I can learn about the ways to worship. Because I think too often, far too often, we define worship as what happens on the instruments and on the screen on Sunday mornings. Are you tracking with me? In fact, we describe it. Listen, we have, we, have, um, we have four parts of our service. We have praise and worship. We have the word, offering. We have the word. And then we have uh, a prayer. We, there's four. And so, and what happens in the music and all, we describe as praise and worship. And that has gotten into our mentality. But you understand, worship is so much more than what happens on that screen and on this stage on a Sunday morning. Worship is about far more than that. And let's, I want to show you just a few lessons here about worship. First of all, you can worship by loosening others. You can worship by loosening others. There is a picture here of those disciples going, Paul, and untying that colt. And when the owner said, why are you untying the colt? The, they said, because the Lord needs him. I got to tell you something. This is more, there, is, there is something that, that is a picture of what the church and the Christian ought to be doing. We ought to be, as a phrase, as a part of worship, we ought to be untying people and loosening them because the Lord has need of them. That's part of your worship. You do that with your witness. You do that with your testimony. You do that by living a life in front of them. You boo that, do that by being willing to share with them when they say, what's the reason for your joy? What's the reason that you worship? Being prepared to them, you loose them. You loose them. That's part of worship. Loosening others with the truth of Jesus Christ is part of worship. It's not just what happens on the stage. It's what happens every day. Another thing is this. It goes hand in hand with the second with the first that is this, is that you worship by bringing others to him. There's story after story after story. Especially you see it in the calling of the disciples where one of them found Jesus and went and got somebody else to find Jesus who went and got somebody else to brought them to Jesus. And I got to tell you this morning, there's something you worship others when you bring them to Jesus, when you bring them face to face with the resurrection and the life. Now, I know I've talked about it for three weeks now, and I'm going to plug it in here again because it's absolutely relevant. Do you understand, do you understand that your willingness this week to ask somebody to be here next Sunday, to come and attend church with you, to tell them that you'll meet them at the front door, to tell them that they can sit with you, do you understand that is an act of worship to Jesus Christ when you bring people to him? And so I'm asking you this morning, just ask them, and as you do, let it be an act of worship. Amen? A -a 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 Amen? All right. You worship by giving to him what you have. You worship their giving to him by what you have. It's interesting in this story as they went along there, they took, many took their cloaks, that is their outer coat, 
They placed it on the donkey. They laid it out on the, uh, on the road, uh, and they essentially made it him a coat carpet, a carpet of coats for him to ride in on that donkey. You see what they were doing? A coat was very valuable in that line. In that time, a coat was 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 uh, was one of the most important garments that you have, even more important than the than the other clothes that you have because of uh, the expense of it and what it took to get it and what it served in that time. So you see what they did? They worshipped by taking that was dear to them and precious to them and laying it before Jesus Christ, the Hosanna. And so they worshipped him by giving him that which is the most important to them. Can I tell you this morning? Listen, you and I as as Christians, we ought to be worshiping him with the most valuable that we have. Our most valuable things should be offered in worship to him. Whatever it is you value the most, you should use as an act of worship by offering it to him. Amen. You see, worship is about loosening others. It's about bringing others to him, about giving what you have. Another part of this worship is this. You can worship with what you can find. Some didn't have coats, or maybe after they had given their coat, that wasn't enough worship. So they ran, and they broke palm branches off, and they brought the palm branches, and they began to wave the palm branches and to line the streets with palm branches. You see what's going on here? They worship not just with what they had. They worshiped with whatever they find. Can I tell you something this morning? As Christians, you and I am going to challenge all of us this morning about worship. I think far too often we miss opportunities to worship him in the everyday common things of life. Listen to me. You and I need to find those palm branches, find those things in our life that he deserves worship for and offer them as worship to him in the everyday of life. We assign worship to those spiritual moments. We assign thanks and praise for that. You know, so, uh, um, you might be one, as, as I know I have in my life, I've heard some of you say the same things. We, um, that you have some had close calls in an automobile, and, and, um, and you worship him for delivering you for those close calls, maybe a wreck or an avoided wreck or something. But do you think to worship him because you have a car? Do you think to worship him when you, when you turn it on and it starts? How many of you in the last six weeks have turned it on and it didn't start? Right? Do you think to worship him because it starts, because you have a car? And I could go on and on and on, right? We worship him with the tithe and the offering, the missions. I emphasized it this morning. But do you thank him for the rest? Come on now, I know I'm challenging you. I'm getting, I'm getting right down where we live today. You know, I, Lord, I thank you, and I give you my tithe, I give you my offering, but do you thank him for the other 90% or 80% or whatever it is he allows you to keep, to live on? You see, in the everyday things of life, we worship him. We worship him when he's delivered us from sickness. I've done it. And I will continue to do it. But do you worship him when you wake up in the morning and you take a deep breath and you say, Lord, I worship you today because I can breathe and I can get up and I can go to work. I worship you for my help and with my health. Amen. Worship him in the everyday things that you find. I'm telling you, this will change your life. If you learn to be thankful for the everyday things of life, every day will be better. Amen. Every day will be better. You worship him regardless of the threat. Remember, the Roman guards were there. The Roman guards were there. The Roman guards were on guard against any type of rebellion. Remember, just, third, just 70 years before this, there had been this, uh, I'm sorry, just a, a few decades before this, there had been this huge rebellion. And so the, uh, the, the, the guards were on guard against any kind of rebellion. And certainly a parade where they're claiming somebody other than Caesar to be king was a threat. But I got to tell you something this morning. These folks worship regardless of the threat that was there. It may look like a rebellion, but I'm going to worship. It may look like it's against Caesar, but I'm going to worship. It, I may be thrown in jail for it, but I'm going to worship. I got to tell you something. I didn't think in my lifetime I would ever stand in the pulpit and say this, but listen to me. The threat's real to not worship in America today. The threat's real to not 
live your standards in worship, to uphold biblical standards in worship, to not proclaim the things of Christ that are what they are, the things of the Bible that are. And there is a threat to that today. Can I tell you, never in American history that I know of has there been an occasion when you and I need to rise up and say, I'm going to worship regardless of the threat that is there. I'm going to worship. Amen. I'm going to worship. One last thing. Last word, less in way that we worship. Worship despite the opposition. The Pharisees, the Pharisees were opposed to this because they had their own agenda. I said that a moment ago. They opposed him because they wanted things done their way. But I got to tell you this morning, these people worship despite the Roman soldiers and despite the Pharisees. Uh, listen, I'm one who can tell you from experience, and every one of you has faced the same thing. Life sometimes is going to oppose your worship. There are going to be difficulties. There's going to be hardship. There's going to be things you don't explain. There's going to be things that don't seem fair. There's going to be stuff that doesn't go your way. I'm telling you, you got to worship despite the opposition and through the opposition. That's just life sometimes. But I'm telling you, it'll always go better when you worship the one who is in charge and can control of it all. Amen? Worship. That's just some of the ways that we worship. Some of the ways that we worship. So this morning I want to give you, I want to give you two questions. I want to ask two important questions to you and I. And let's just get practical. Let's just get real here. Two important questions this morning. One is this. This is for you to consider this. Why are you worshiping Jesus? Some worshipped him because they thought he would give them more bread. He had fed the 5,000. He had fed the 4,000. Some worshipped him because they thought he would give them, he would give them more bread. Us, others worshipped him because they thought he would give them power. In fact, some of even the disciples were in on this initially. They thought it was a way to get to power. Many worshipped him because Jesus had done something miraculous for them. You might even say, in a way, the donkey worshipped him by being that ride for him into Jerusalem. But Mary and Martha worshipped him because Jesus had given them their brother back from the dead. And Lazarus, oh, Lazarus. Yeah, there was a great crowd that was there this morning. That morning, some were worshiping for the bread, some for the power, some for the miracles they had seen, some for the miracles in their family. But Lazarus, I think, worshiped more than anybody else in that crowd because Lazarus was the one that was cold dead in the grave four days that Jesus had called called for and resurrected him from the day. I imagine Lazarus' voice of worship outshout in all of them because he had experienced resurrection and life himself. So I want to ask you this morning, why are you worshiping him? Why are you worshiping him? Every single person here this morning, you have a reason to worship him. He's done a miracle in your life. He's provided something in your life. He's given you an answer in your life. Every one of you here this morning have something you can look at. Say, God, you healed me when I was sick. Uh, Lord, you canceled the doctor's word and you gave your word. Lord, you gave me a job when nobody else would give a job. Lord, Lord you answered my prayer for my marriage or my family when I didn't it was coming anywhere else. And every single person here has a reason to worship him for what he did on the cross. We, we, we uh, sang about it a few moments ago. The old rugged cross uh, that he bore for our sins. For our sins. Every one of us has a reason to worship. What's your reason for worship? Because your reason for worship determines your worship. That's the first question. Why are you worshiping him? Can I encourage you? This week, to ask yourself, why am I worshiping? In fact, I encourage you to make a list. If you start making a list, you better get a notebook. Not just, not just a page. Not just a piece of paper. You better get a notebook. You might ought to get one of those five subject notebooks, right? Because uh, every person here has a reason to worship. The second question is this. How are you worshiping? I think this week I need to ask myself, Lord, why am I worshiping and how am I worshiping? The disciples worshiped him by obeying him. The owners worshiped by giving their coat. The crowd worshiped by placing their coats there before him. 
others worship by finding palm branches and putting there. Worshiping in whatever way they can. The stones were even ready to worship if nobody else did. (laughs) So let me ask you this morning. Are you worshiping Jesus with your whole life? We think, we automatically think about gifts and talents and tithes and offering. But let me ask you this. Are you worshiping with your service? With your service? Can I tell you a short story, real short story in my life, personal thing in my life? Many, many, many years ago, Gerald and I have been married uh, 37 years. We've been in ministry 36 of those years. Our very first pastor, it was a very, very, very small church where Gerald and I did it all. Most pastors, many pastors, can relate to that. Miss Joy can relate to that. Vaughn can relate to that, where we did it all. And I remember on one particular Sunday afternoon when I was back over at the church after service, and I was moving chairs. We had had a fellowship, and I mean, it was a small church, and everybody had left, and it was left to Jerry Lynn and I to, to clean up. And I was, she was cleaning, and I was, I was doing the chairs. And, um, well, let's just say I didn't have a good attitude. Right? And the Lord just spoke to my heart, if you, do this for, if you do this in worship to me, it won't seem so much like work for you. And when your worship has become work, you've lost your reason for worship. And so everything in our life should be used to worship him, and it'll seem less like work for him. Can I get amen this morning? That's Sunday school teachers. That's Wednesday night teachers. That's ushers. That's greeters. That's, that's those that are singing on the praise and worship team. If your service, if your service has become like work, rediscover your why, and it'll be more like worship. Amen? Do you, work, do you worship him with your job? Now, I know I'm getting all up in your Kool-Aid now. You worship him with your job. Is your job worship to him? You do understand your job is not only about supplying and your needs for your family. God has placed you there with those group of scoundrels. I mean people. He's placed you there in that context for a reason and for a season. It may not last forever, but for this season, use that workplace as worship to him. You might be amazed when the scoundrels get saved. You might be amazed at what God does in the workplace. Do you worship him with your work? Do you worship him with your job? Do you worship him with your stuff? Do you worship him with your relationships? Your marriage should be a place of worship. It should be a testimony to the world of the relationship between Christ and the church. That's what the Bible tells us. Do you worship him with your body? Do you worship him with your body, your soul, your spirit? See, all of life can be worship and should be because he is worthy of all my worship. Here it is this morning in a sentence. In order to fully live, worship Jesus with your whole life. In order to fully live, worship Jesus with your whole life. Now, this message this morning, this message this morning, I'll just, I'll I'll leave you with this. This message this morning is deeply personal to me. Prior to 2014, when I had the vocal cord cancer and the treatments, some of you remember, I loved to sing, and I was good. (laughs) Thank you, Mike. One person believes it. (laughs) I even sang on the praise and worship team, if you can believe that. (laughs) Worshipped in the car. I worshipped mo. I sang in the car. I sang uh, cutting the grass. I I sang. I sang all the time. I sang at home, and I love to worship with my singing. In 2014, after the vocal cord cancer and the treatments, I rarely can sing anymore. I rarely can sing anymore. In fact, you do know, right, this confession, you do know that when I'm over here on Sunday morning, I'm totally lip-syncing it. Totally, completely lip-syncing it. 
because I'm saving my voice to preach. I can't sing. I can't use my voice. So I started worshiping demonstratively. I, 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 I dance and I move and I've been known to run <laughs> and, and to pace. And, and, and so I just became more demonstrative and I, and I clap. You wonder why I clap so loud? I clap so loud because I can't sing. Krista told me one Sunday morning, she said, you clap so loud, I thought Jesus was coming back. <laughs> and then about a year ago, I tore the meniscus in my knee. I couldn't move like that. In fact, many services I had to sit. You remember, for about a year I had to sit. So I worshiped by praying. See, when you were singing, and when you were dancing, and when you were playing... I was worshiping through praying. What, what, what are you getting at, Pastor? What I'm getting at is this. When worship is in your soul, when you have a reason to worship, you are going to find some way to worship. And it's going to permeate every part of your life. And you're going to worship him just because he is worthy. And the one we worship is truly worthy of all of our worship this morning. Amen? He's worthy of worship. So this morning, I want to just challenge you. Remember your why for worship, right? And examine your how of worship and worship him with your whole life. Amen? I'll give you this piece of information. I promise I'll close. Here's, I'm going to help you with that this week. I'm going to help you with that this week. One thing I'm going to do this week, I did it about a decade ago. But this week, it's going to start this afternoon. And every morning for this entire week, it's Holy Week. It's Holy Week. Today's Palm Sunday. It goes all the way through next Sunday, which is Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday. And every day you're going to get a short devotion from me. It's going to be a scripture, a passage to read. And just about two or three cents. It literally will take you less than five minutes to do it. But the whole focus of it is going to be to get you to incorporate worship as an everyday part of your life. And can I ask you to please just take, it'll be five minutes of your day. Look for those devotions this afternoon. I didn't want to send this afternoon, the one this morning, today until after the service. But every morning, look for that. In the, in the line, you will see uh, Easter devotion, Easter devotion, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Look for those. And what I want you to do with them is worship. Read that scripture. It'll be something thought-provoking, something for you to, to just think about. And then through the day, can you, can you use that as a, a vehicle for worship him, him? And when you do, I'm telling you, worship is infectious. <laughs> worship is infectious. When you become intentional with it, then it begins to affect every other area of your life. So I want to challenge you this week to worship him with your whole life. He is worthy of our worship. If you agree with that this morning, I want you to stand to your feet. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your worship, for your service, what you gave, for what you did. We worship you this morning. Before I dismiss, Lord, before I dismiss, I issue a call to every person here to remember why they worship and examine how they worship. And there may be some, Lord, who are worshiping the wrong things. Mm. There may be some that are watching online. There may be some in this service. I wasn't going to go here, but I'm going to take just a moment and do this because it's welling up in my spirit. Some of you this morning as I was preaching, you might realize you were worshiping the wrong thing. I'm not saying you don't love Jesus. I'm saying you realize that your time and your focus and your attention and what moves you may be off-center or misplaced some. And I want to tell you this morning, if, that's, if, that, if that welled up in you, i got to tell you this morning, you need this morning to take a moment and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I ask your forgiveness for letting anything else take the center of my life. My healing's not the center of my life. Getting my problem fixed is not the center of my life. 
giving an answer to my question is not the center of my life. My wife, my husband, my children are not the center of my life. Lord, you are the center of my life. And this morning, I encourage you. Listen, I feel this strongly. If there's anything that you feel like has moved and has taken the center just this morning, take a moment. Lord, we all right now, we examine ourselves. And we make sure this morning, Lord, that nothing has replaced you as the center of our worship. Holy Spirit, we give to that pulling, that tugging of the Holy Spirit right now. We give to it right now. And we ask you, Lord, to move in hearts right now. I want every head bowed and every eyes closed. If that's you, listen, nobody will see this but me. If that's you this morning, I want to be praying with you this week. Because it's hard to move something off center that is taking the center. I want to be praying for you. If there's something in your life, I'm not saying you're lost, you're going to hell. I'm not saying, I'm saying if there's something in your life you know has been, has got, has in the center and it shouldn't be, I want you to just, live, just raise your hand. I just want to know who I'm praying for. If there's something, if there's something that God's convicted you, I want you to raise your hand real quick. I see one hand. Is there another? Is there another? If there's something this morning, if there's something this morning, thank you. Thank you. I'll be praying for you this week. Now, Lord, I thank you. I pray that every one of us this week, would rediscover our why of worship and re-examine our how of worship and make sure that our worship is worthy of the one that we worship. We thank you and we praise you for it today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I pray that you would be blessed in the Lord. This Wednesday night, we're going to continue what we started last Wednesday night. How do I know the will of God? question I've been asked more than any other question. The conversation got so deep, so good, that we're going to continue it down again this week. If you are not here on Wednesday nights, can I tell you, someone told me recently, he said, Pastor, people that aren't coming on Wednesday nights are missing a diamond in the rough. A diamond in the rough. God has really does something when we come together and we have those discussions about what his word says to us. So I encourage you to come. Till I see you again, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face be, shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in the blessings of the Lord and worship this week and ask them. Ask them. God bless you. I love you.